Well, on Twitter the other day, I said I was going to be interviewing Augustine of Hippo. That's, of course, not true in the most technical sense. But I will be sitting down with Augustine of Hippo in his book on the Trinity, particularly Book 1, Chapter 7, where he presses the question, in what manner the Son is less than the Father and than himself, which is a very helpful way of introducing the issue and the topic that's at hand today. Uh, we'll look a little bit uh, at Hilary of Poitiers as well, which is one of uh, Augustine's um, favorite uh, resources. He is uh, he is going back and forth with Hillary quite often throughout his um, uh, throughout his own literature, and so uh, we'll look at Hillary, who essentially does the same thing with regard to the hypostatic union in relation to you know part of exegesis. What we're going to do here, as we look at Augustine, the point that I want to make is uh, that number one, there is in the person of Christ united two natures, following the Incarnation, obviously. Um, from the point at which the Son assumes to himself the fullness of a human nature, there are in the person of Christ united two natures without confusion, without composition, and without conversion. And so I, I want to first of all make that point, but then I want to draw uh, the implication from that into our exegesis, the way in which we read Scripture, and uh, we'll look at Hillary a little bit uh, for that, um, though I did post an entire article on um, Hillary uh, of Poitiers and uh, part of exegesis, so feel free to check that out on the thebaptistbroadcast.com. Um, just to get started here, I would like to go back to what I said uh at the chapter heading, chapter 7, book 1, uh, on the Trinity. Before I do that, welcome to the Baptist Broadcast. We are available anywhere you get your podcasts, uh, Spotify, Podcast Addict, iTunes, you name it. Uh, it's likely that the Baptist Broadcast is there. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, do not forget to click the subscribe button down below uh, and the bell for continued notifications. So the, the chapter heading is so helpful because it brings something out that you know, others throughout church history have done a, a, a biblical, a rich biblical reality of the two natures in Christ really applied to the way in which we speak about the person of Christ and, and the way in which we understand biblical language uh, insofar as as that biblical language is, is Christological. So um, Matthew Henry once said, I think this is in regard to uh, John 17, that as God— he, the son, was prayed to, but as a man, he prayed. And Augustine brings out a, a very similar angle here in the 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 the, the ch in chapter seven, um, and uh, chapter just the chapter heading. In what manner the son is less than the father and than himself? How can the son be less than himself? Well. If the person of the Son subsists simultaneously in two distinct natures, one divine, which is the highest, infinite, uh, you know, immutable, omnipresent, and so on, uh, and also in a human nature, which is always subservient to the divine, then, of course, there is a right way to understand how the Son is at once God and also less than God in his human nature, or according to the human nature that he has assumed to himself. And once we understand what is going on with the person of Christ, the hypostatic union, the doctrine of the incarnation, uh, this beautiful Christology, and once we have this kind of like Christological uh, reality crystallized in our minds, that has certain implications for the way in which we approach the biblical text. Uh, and if we don't approach the biblical text in a way that preserves the person of Christ in his two natures— uh, and, and preserves those two natures, divine and human, then not only will we destroy uh, those natures by confusing them with one another uh, or by turning them into persons and therefore destroying the person of Christ, um, but we'll destroy the gospel as well. And, uh, and, and if we destroy the humanity of Christ, for example, if we, if we divinize the humanity of Christ, uh, then we destroy 
the gospel, because what is not assumed by the Lord is not redeemed. So the reason Jesus assumes to himself the fullness of a human nature is to redeem humanity, it's to redeem the human nature, which is fallen, uh, of course, following the fall of Adam and the entrance of sin into the world. Um, and so we, we need to get this right. Uh, and uh, if we get this right, if we can get it right, then we need to read the text of Scripture, I submit, in a way that takes it into, an, into account and in a way that, that, that preserves these, these natures that are united in the, in the one person of, of the Son. Um, I want to go through something that Augustine says here in chapter 7, book 1 of On the Trinity. Uh, he says this, for in the form of a servant, which he took, he is less than the Father. Okay, and, and uh, I'm just going to actually, what I'll do is I'll just read through this, and then we'll go back through it and dissect it. So, for in the form of a servant, which he took, he is less than the Father. But in the form of God, in which also he was before he took the form of a servant, he is equal to the Father. In the form of God, he is the Word, by whom all things were are made, but in the form of a servant, he was made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. In like manner, in the form of God, he made man. In the form of a servant, he was made man. And you, you get that kind of language in, in you know, uh, the Reformers and in the Puritans. Uh, Matthew Henry, you know, as I mentioned earlier with regard to John 17, says something very similar. And so... Uh, What's going on here? Well, Augustine is, to sum it up, very carefully distinguishing between the two natures that are in the one person of Christ. And you notice that he is talking about the same person throughout, and that is the person of the Son, yet he is uh, understanding the person of the Son according to two natures, two distinct natures in the Son, divine and human. And so, for example, in the first line, he says, for in the form of a servant, which he took, he is less than the father. Now, Augustine's using this language that he took to himself this, this servant nature, and by that he means the human nature. And when he uses that language that he took this to himself, that's the language of assumption. Uh, he assumed to himself the fullness of a human nature, and technically speaking, this assumption is not a, a, a subtraction of who the Son uh, is as God. Uh, he's not becoming less than God to be human. Um, it's, and, and technically speaking, it's not an addition, uh, as if he is adding to himself something that he did not have, or a, a perfection or, or a quality that he did not have before. Um, Dr. James Dalzell has a wonderful article on academia.edu. It was part of a, a journal, and it, it's on the issue of terminative assumption, and I would encourage you to go read that article. It's very helpful in understanding, in all of its technicalia, uh, the kind of assumption we want to understand of the Son and, and the human nature that he took into union with himself. But in short, what I wanted to get out here, this first line, Augustine is, is speaking of assumption. Um, the, the correct language, the proper language that we use is not, you know, this. it's not to, it's not to say the son added something to himself. It's not to say that the son subtracted something from himself. It is to say that the son assumed a human nature to himself, a servant nature. For in the form of a servant, which he took, so he's using the Philippians language, you know, form of God, form of a bondservant, uh, for in the form of a servant which he assumed, or which he took, he is less than the Father. Notice the only way in which Augustine recognizes uh, or observes the lessness of the Son in relation to the Father is in his servant form, or in his servant nature. So according to his servant nature, he is less than the Father. And then he goes on to say, But in the form of God, in which also he was before he took the form of a servant, he is equal to the Father. And what he's saying there is that according to the divine nature, in in the form of God or the Son qua God, he is equal to the Father. Let's relate this a little bit to some contemporary issues. For example, eternal functional subordination, EFS, or eternal relational authority submission, ERAS, uh, positions that are espoused by you know Bruce Ware, Wayne Grudem, uh, Owen Strayan, 
um, and you know uh, several others. And 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 in large part, it is that EFS position has been assumed by uh, by many whom we wouldn't necessarily expect to assume that position um, throughout recent history. I'd say over the last you know 150 years or so. Um, Douglas Wilson espouses a form of, of EFS, um, and, and we looked at that as we went through our series in Federal Vision. That's the very first episode that I, I, I look at that and cover some of that in the second episode as well in that series on the Federal Vision that I just recently published. Um, so this position is everywhere. The assumption that eternally, in some sense, the Son is in submission to the Father. Um it, the assumption is that because the Son was sent into the world, that there has to be some kind of a mechanical or some kind of a, a, a relationship dynamic before the Incarnation that makes necessary some kind of submission even before the Incarnation. And so, the, again, it's an assumption because the text isn't being read with pre-modern uh, eyes. It's being read with modern eyes, and that causes all sorts of problems. But, um, but the assumption basically submits that there is submission in the Godhead prior to the incarnation. This isn't submission just according to the human nature of Christ. This is a a, a submission that is uh, integral to the to the Godhead. And so, there's an actual willful submission on the part of the Son and the Holy Spirit to the Father. Um, and uh, the, the problem with this, of course, is that, you know, orthodoxy has declared for uh, centuries upon centuries that there is no greater than or less than in the Trinity. Uh, there's no gradation, you know, between Father and Son. Everything that's predicated of God is, is predicated of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and so you get the Athanasian Creed that there, in this Trinity there is no greater or lesser. Um, and throughout throughout church history and in, in the Reformed confessions and, and so on, there is the affirmation that uh, that the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit are consubstantial. Uh, they are co-equal, um, and uh, they are uh, of the same essence. Uh, it, to put it another way, uh, perhaps more precisely, um, all that may be said of God generally may be predicated of all the persons. Um, because the Father just is God, the Son just is God, the Holy Spirit just is God. And it's not as if, like, the Father has some of the divine essence, the Son has some of the divine essence, and the Holy Spirit has some of the divine essence. No, all three persons are the divine essence according to particular mode of subsistence. Um, and so, uh, w whenever we uh, don't take those things into consideration— and whenever we, whenever we fail to understand what the divine nature is um, and what a human nature is, then we begin to read the text in such a way that leads us to conclusions more similar to something like EFS or tritheism or social Trinitarianism, where there's this kind of eternal submission in the Godhead going on. But if we have the categories of Augustine where... You know, he says, for in the form of a servant, he's less than the Father. In the form of God, he is equal to the Father, right? Uh, he, he's, he's equal to the Father in all, in all things. Uh, then we are less prone, we get that conviction codified in our own thinking, we're less prone to fall into the exegetical errors that arise as we read the text that would lead us to some of those false conclusions. And, and it's a very simple distinction. It's not one that's easy to understand but it is one that is quite simple to articulate, as Augustine just has here. And, and, and to, to maybe put it in more contemporary language, you know, uh, when we're stating the, in, the doctrine of the Incarnation, um, uh, or we're articulating the, the hypostatic union and what that means, it is to say that the person of the Son, one person, uh, has assumed to himself the fullness of a human nature, and therefore... In the person of the Son, there is united, without confusion, composition, or conversion, both divine and human natures. Okay, so it, it's pretty easy to state, but understanding what that is is very difficult. All right, and I understand that some, uh, you know, not maybe maybe not understanding what a nature is uh, will will work perhaps the wrong way 
in order to kind of try and explain and understand what is going on in the incarnation and that will that will perhaps lead to some canonic theories where you know the son becomes man by way of subtracting something from his deity uh, or it will lead to some kind of false understanding of who God is because they're trying to reason from the incarnate Christ and the human the Christ in his human nature it, to God uh, in himself and so that creates problems um, and uh, there are examples of this throughout recent history. Karl Barth is one of them. Uh, reasons everything through the lens of of the second person of the Holy Trinity and uh, and Christ as he as he comes to us. Um, and, and so there are all sorts of problems that that uh, arise when we get the method wrong. But it all it all falls apart whenever we don't have the incarnational language uh, categories. Um, in place first. And so just continuing on here with Augustine, he's equal to the Father according to his deity. He's lesser than the Father according to his humanity. He goes on and he says, in the form of God, he is the word by whom all things are made. But in the form of a servant, he was made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. In like manner, in the form of God, he made man, right? Creator. He's the creator. In the form of a servant, he was made man. All right. So that, that he's basically in that uh, section of text that I just read, he's, he's just articulating, he's saying the same point. He's making the same point in, in, in different ways um, to drive it home and to codify it in our own thinking. And, and to, to just summarize what he's saying, he's saying, According to the divine nature, he's creator. According to his human nature, he was made man. He was, uh, he was mutable, right? He's, but that's according to his human nature. We ascribe that which is proper to Christ's human nature, uh, or or to humanity, to Christ's human nature, and we ascribe that which is proper to divinity to Christ's divine nature, right? And we make that distinction so that as we read the text of Scripture. And we read things that are proper only to a created nature, but nevertheless said of the person of Christ, we have to understand that language as being proper to the person of Christ according to his human nature. Because if we take those passages that uh, predicate things proper to humanity or proper to the creature only of Christ the person— and we transfer those things to 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 God in Himself, to to His divinity, to Christ's deity. Then what we will do is we'll confuse the creator-creature distinction, and that's a big problem. So that if we take the ignorance of Christ, for example, uh, and we say you know these passages that that imply the ignorance of Christ, where you know in Luke Luke tells us that He grew in knowledge, right? So uh, He learned, you know, Jesus learned. Um, and, and then in other places, you know, we learn that the sun doesn't know the day or the hour, and there's been different ways in which that has been worked out exegetically. But one of the ways that's been worked out exegetically is to say that, yeah, he did not know according to his human nature. Because we don't want to take those passages that are, that are, that are predicating things of Christ proper only to a human nature and transfer them to the divine. Because what happens is we begin... Um, we begin um, creaturefying the divine nature. We begin bringing the divine nature into the economy and thinking of the divine nature as an article of the creation uh, and as something that is univocal to to what man is, um, and 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 thus destroying the doctrine of God. And and that's what that's what ends up happening when there are uh, false you know, Christologies uh, or or just erroneous Christologies that confuse, you know, the natures, the two natures of Christ together, or uh, or perhaps they, they separate them all together to where they're not even related to one another or united in the one person of Christ, thereby making them two persons. There are those two extremes, but, but that one extreme where the two natures are mixed together and the divine nature is kind of made, mingled in with the human nature— well then, what that the implication of that is that the doctrine of God is destroyed, 
the doctrine of God is is now uh, marred. It's not held in its integrity and 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 harmonized with the doctrine of the incarnation. It's actually destroyed in order to serve a misunderstanding of the doctrine of the incarnation, and and that's what something like a canonic theory of Christology would do, where you know the Son is said to forfeit some of his divine prerogatives or or his divine attributes as he is a man, right? So he he leaves the throne. He it's said that he he lays aside you know divine attributes or 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 divine prerogatives in order to become a man and so what that does is it implies change in god there goes immutability uh it it, it implies you know uh, a denial of omnipresence why did the son have to leave the throne to become a man when there is no place where the son is not for example um and so we, we have to get this distinction right. And then once we get the distinction right, I, which I think a lot of people actually do have the distinction right um, in, in many cases, but when they go to read the text, it's like they, they want to try to read the text without it. But I think we need to be comfortable with reading the text theologically, not in a way that shoves you know artificial theology into the text, but in a way that takes into account other things that Scripture says and doesn't forget those more fundamental articles of the faith as we reason through the text of Scripture in other places. Um, Hilary of, of, of uh, Poitiers does um, the same thing. He says, um, and this is in his volume uh, on the Trinity, he says, so the, dis- so the dispensation by which he means the fullness of times, the, the incarnation— so the dispensation, the age of the incarnation, we could say maybe. Um, so the dispensation of the great and godly mystery makes him, who was already father of the divine Son, also his Lord in the created form which he assumed. Now that's kind of hard to understand because the word order is a little bit confusing. But but what uh, Hillary is saying is that the Son is subservient to the Father, and the Father is the Son's Lord, insofar as the Son. Uh, has assumed a created form, i.e. a human nature. So the dispensation of the great and godly mystery, the incarnation, makes him who was already father, who was already father, so he's talking about the father, makes the father of the divine son also his lord. The father is lord over the son, but only according to the son's created form, or only according to the son's human nature. For he who was in the form of God was found also in the form of a servant, yet he was not a servant. For according to the Spirit, he was God the, son, God the Son of God. And so what he's wanting to say there, he's wrestling with these two natures, right? Uh, and what he's wanting to say there is that at one and the same time, the person of the Son is in the form of God, Philippians 2. But also, he's in the form of a servant, he is at once God and also not God, all right? Those two realities obtain in the person of Christ because those two natures, divine and human, are perfectly united in the one person of the Son. And then uh, Hillary goes on, he says, Being then in the form of a servant, talking about his human nature, Jesus Christ, who before was in the form of God, said as a man, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God, and your God. And what he's doing there is he is uh, looking at, um, he is looking at uh, John chapter 20, verse 17, partitively. So he quotes, I ascend to my Father, and your Father, and my God, and your God. And that's Jesus speaking. And Hillary is saying, he's saying those things as a man. All right, because he, he, Again, something there in John 20 is said that properly only belongs to a creature, and that is the the ability and the propensity to ascend, right? Um, God, properly speaking, does not ascend, right? He he doesn't he doesn't go anywhere. There is no place where God is not, and so the person of the Son had to assume a nature capable of ascending from earth to heaven, all right? Um, And there are several passages like that in Scripture that we have to understand. 
for example, if he's going to stand in our place, if the son is going to stand in our place as our mediator, uh, he has to he has to be born under the law uh, and be subservient to the law and obey the law as a man obeys the law. But to do that, he has to assume a nature capable of doing so. Um, and so what Hillary is saying here is that the language of I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God is is spoken according to his human nature. Uh, also, the fact that he is saying that uh, he, he's putting himself on the level with his people by saying, you know, he's my father and your father. Um, there's a sense in which the father of the son is not the father of the son as he is our father. <laughs> Um, that is by, by mean by way of eternal generation, right? So according to the uh, peculiar properties in the Godhead that distinguishes one person from the other, which is the, which is the uh, uh, it, it, eternal order, uh, the uh, order of processions, um, the relation between father and son is is different than our relation to our heavenly Father. And and part of Hillary's point here is is to say that the reason Jesus is able to speak this way and put himself on the same, you know, plane or, or, or level with his people is because he has assumed a nature by which he can do so. Um, he goes on, he says, he, he was speaking as a servant to servants. How can we then dis- dissociate the words from Christ the servant and transfer them to that nature which had nothing of the servant in it? For he who abode in the form of God took upon him the form of a servant, this form being the indispensable condition of his fellowship as a servant with servants. So what he's saying there when he says, um, uh, he asks a rhetorical question, how can we then dissociate the words from Christ, the servant, and transfer them to that nature which had nothing of the servant in it? In other words, what he's saying rhetorically, he's saying, we don't transfer that which is proper to a servant nature to that which has nothing of a servant in it, which is the divine nature. So we have to be careful to distinguish between the divine nature and the human nature united in the one person of Christ. When we read texts of scripture, like I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God, we have to realize that those things which are said in places like that, that are proper only to Christ's humanity, we have to predicate only uh, of the person of Christ according to his human nature. Um, in John 17, when Jesus prays to his Father, uh, if we were to understand that as some kind of, you know, uh, inter-Trinitarian communication that was going on in God himself, where there's this kind of reception of speech from one person to another, uh, that would be problematic for a number of reasons. Divine immutability... Uh, the fact that there's only one will in the Godhead and not three wills, um, you know, uh, all of that would be compromised if we took John 17, the high priestly prayer of the mediator, and we said, well, that's going on in the Godhead because Christ is doing it in his human nature. No, we have to understand that as a man, Christ is praying, but as God, he is receiving that prayer, right? Um, as one God with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son is receiving the same prayer that, according to his human nature, he is issuing up while he lives on earth. And so, uh, again, that's that's an example of reading the text partitively, being able to, in light of the doctrine of the Incarnation, distinguish between language in Scripture that is proper to deity versus language in Scripture that is proper only to humanity or proper only to the creature. And so hopefully that was helpful. Uh, again, I, I meant to spend more time on Augustine, but we, we spent a little bit of time on, on Hillary uh, of Poitier as well. Um, and again, check out that article on, on the Baptist Broadcast website, thebaptistbroadcast.com. Uh, it's titled, uh, it's the first one up there right now, but it's titled uh, Hillary of Poitier, uh, Incarnation and Partitive exegesis. So I would encourage you to read that, kind of perhaps even as a uh, helpful supplement uh, to this podcast episode. If this helped you, maybe it'll help somebody else. Feel free to share it. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day.